today's speaker and the reason for your 1,000 subscriptions, Edward Witten of the Institute for Advanced Studies. We'll talk about volumes and random matrices. Um, thank you, Ron. And thank you for um, putting together this series of lectures and for inviting me to speak. Uh, I hope I'll succeed in sharing the screen. Uh, has that worked? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'll even go to full screen, which I hope will uh, work. So um, today I'm going to be talking about the volume of the modular space M sub G of Riemann surfaces of genus G. And in the last part of the talk, we also will discuss the volume of the corresponding modular space of super Riemann surfaces. So we'll, as well, we'll consider Riemann surfaces with punctures or boundaries. And we'll discuss how these volumes are related to ensembles of random matrices. This is actually an old story with a very contemporary twist. And I'll review a little bit of the old story and explain what's new. So the main references, I'll be talking a lot about a paper by Saad Schenker and Stanford from last year. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll explain work I did with Stanford. And there are a couple other references I've indicated here that are also relevant. So we'll start with the ordinary Riemann surfaces and the corresponding classical moduli space, M sub G, and we'll postpone super Riemann surfaces, which may be less familiar to the end of the lecture. So what's meant by the volume of moduli space? Well, one answer is that the moduli space has a natural Ve peterson symplectic structure. One way to define the symplectic structure is huge gauge theory. A complex structure on a Riemann surface of genus bigger than one is associated to a flat PSL2R connection that I'll call A. So moduli space parameterizes a family of such flat connections, modulo the action of the mapping class group. And that leads to a natural definition of a symplectic structure, which is the, given by the same formula that was used by Atiyah and Bott in discussing symplectic structures in gauge theory in two dimensions. So if A is the connection, delta A is its differential, Delta is simply the exterior derivative in the space of all connections. So this formula defines a, two, a closed two form on the space of connections. It descends to a symplectic form on the space of connections mod gauge transformations. So that's a definition of the Vey Peterson form. And once we have it, the volume is the natural volume of moduli space as a symplectic manifold. Now, from this point of view, a Riemann surface isn't just a complex manifold of dimension one. It's the, it, it's the quotient of the upper half plane by a discrete group. So it carries a hyperbolic metric, which is a Romanian metric of constant curvature minus two that's pulled back from the upper half plane. And it also has a flat SL, PSL2R connection pulled back from the upper half plane, which we used in defining the symplectic form. Now, Although I won't really approach them this way in the lecture, just as a reminder, volumes can also be related to intersection theory of tautological Mumford and Miller classes on moduli space. That's because the symplectic form is actually one of the basic tautological classes. So if you have good formulas for intersection theory on moduli space, you can use them to determine volumes. Mariam Marzucani discovered a kind of converse from a knowledge of the volumes generalized to Riemann surfaces with geodesic boundary, as we'll discuss momentarily, one can deduce the tautological intersection theory. So these facts are facts about bosonic or ordinary Riemann surfaces. They don't generalize well to super Riemann surfaces because there isn't a nice intersection theory on super manifolds. However, for brevity, I won't say more about the relation to intersection theory. We will, however, need volumes for surfaces with boundary. They'll introduce as follows. So let sigma be a hyperbolic Riemann surface of genus G with n boundaries. We specify the lengths. Well, we, first of all, we ask the boundaries to be geodesics and we specify their lengths. So this is meant to be a kind of cartoon picture. Um, uh, not a, perhaps not a very convincing picture, but it's meant to be a picture of a three-hold sphere with a hyperbolic metric and geodesic boundaries of lengths B1, B2, and B3. And then there's a moduli space MGB of hyperbolic structures with that kind of boundary. Uh, 
with specified lengths. And it has a symplectic form and a volume that can be defined by the same formulas as before. Mirtikani showed that these more general volumes are polynomials in the lengths and that the coefficients of the top degree terms in this polynomial are the canonical intersection numbers. So that was the, my assertion I made that she found the converse to the formula for volumes in terms of intersection numbers. Now, the fact that volumes are related to intersection numbers gives one way to calculate them, but it's hard to use this to get explicit formulas. However, this relationship shows that the volumes are related to random matrix ensembles because random matrix, well, my work of 30 years ago on intersection numbers was motivated to work by physicists of that period relating two-dimensional gravity to random matrix ensembles. And Kinsevich's proof involved a connection to a different type of random matrix ensemble. So intersection numbers and therefore volumes have long been known to have multiple relations to random matrix ensembles. But the role of the random matrices was a little bit obscure, at least to me. Uh, part of what I find exciting about the recent developments is that the role of the random matrices is much more transparent because the random matrix has a simple interpretation in terms of the physical model. So in her thesis, Mirtikani actually discovered a direct new way to compute the bosonic volumes independent of their relation to mere, uh, intersection numbers. And I'll explain how Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, following Aynard and Orenton, reinterpreted her results in terms of a random matrix ensemble. So as I remarked a moment ago, in that approach, the role of the random matrices is much more transparent than in previous work, at least in my opinion. Then in the last part of the talk, I'll explain how Stanford and I developed a super analog of this and obtained Mirzakhani style formulas for the super volumes. So I guess since this is the end of the first part of the talk or the introductory part, we could ask if there are questions now. No questions. Okay, then I'll go on. So, well, okay, we're going to be studying M moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with boundaries. But it turns out that it's a good idea to start with what you might regard as a universal case. So we let S1 be a circle and an analog of moduli space as a symplectic manifold is one of the two homogeneous spaces, diff S1 divided by either PSL2R or just U1 regarded as homogeneous symplectic manifolds. So by U1 here, I mean the rota rigid rotations of the circle and PSL2R naturally acts on the circle as well. Thinking of the circle as the boundary of the upper half plane, the action of PSL2R is familiar. So diff S1 mod PSL2R actually is sometimes called universal Teichmuller space for reasons that aren't obviously related to what I'll be explaining. But uh, hopefully uh, this lecture will help convince you that it is a good idea to think of diff S1 mod PSL2R as a universal Teichmuller space, a cousin of the finite dimensional moduli spaces M sub G. So diff S1 mod PSL2R or mod U1, they both have natural symplectic forms because they can be viewed as coadjuvant orbits. And since, I'll, since they can be treated similarly up to a certain point, I'll call either of them curly X. And now as there's some plectic manifolds, you can ask if you can make sense of their volume, but it's believed that this volume has no reasonable definition. So that infinite dimensional integral is considered too divergent, but there's something we can do, which is almost as good. We consider a subgroup of diff S1, a U1 subgroup consisting of rigid rotations of the circle. In other words, we pick some parameterization of the circle by an angle theta and then U1 acts by shifting the angle by a constant. Then there's a moment map H for this action of U1. In other words, if V is the vector field that generates U1 and I sub V is contraction with V, the definition of the moment map is that DH is minus the contraction of V with the symplectic form. Then we introduce a real constant beta and we consider not just the volume, but the integral that would give the volume 
but times the exponential of h over beta. And that integral does make sense as understood by physicists. So the minus sign in my definition of h made sure that h is bounded above, not below. And so this will tend to be a convergent integral. So to make sense of it, we think of ourselves of this as an infinite dimensional version of something that was studied by Dorstermite and Ekman and then reinterpreted by Atiyah and Bott in terms of equivariant cohomology. So <clears throat> for a finite dimensional case, let Y be a symplectic manifold with symplectic form omega and Hamiltonian action of U1. <clears throat> Suppose that there are fixed points P1 up to PS. For simplicity in stating the formula, I'll assume there are finitely many of them rather than manifolds of fixed points. <clears throat> then if H is the moment map, the, the Deutschmann Ekman Atiyabat formula for the, um, gives a formula for this integral in terms of a sum over local data at the fixed point set. If the fixed points are isolated, as I'm assuming, each one is weighted by the exponential of the value of the moment map at that point divided by beta, divided by a denominator, which comes from a determinant of the U or a Fafian really of the U1 action on the tangent space at the fixed point. So that's the Atiyah, that's the Deutschmann Ekman Atiyah Bot formula in finite dimensions. It gives a formula for the integral, the kind of integral we're doing on a symplectic manifold with the U1 action. So we're simply going to borrow it in infinite dimensions. So in the present example, there's only one fixed point in the U1 action on either of these two homogeneous spaces. So there's only one term in the sum and the product over eigenvalues, well, I've written it for the um, case of PSL2R. For the other case, it's the same product where N starts at one instead of two. And we define this infinite product with zeta function regularization or any other reasonable regularization actually. And we get an answer, which I've written. And well, I haven't really explained what I mean by any sensible regularization, but with any sensible regularization, you get the same function of beta with only an overall constant that depends on the regularization. So physicists would say that the constant C is uh, non-universal, but the rest of the formula is universal. So that's the answer for integration over diff S1 mod PSL2R. And there's a similar formula for diff S1 mod U1. So this problem has been studied by a lot of physicists. Its significance was first appreciated in work of Kitaev, who discovered a simple model of quantum holography. His model was studied in much more detail by Maldesena and Stanford. And there have been many derivations of this formula. The one I've sketched is by Stanford and me in the paper I've indicated. Now, I've described this somewhat abstractly. To use the formula, we did not need to know what is the moment map H, only its value at the fixed point. But it's worth mentioning that H is a function of interest. To pick the U1 subgroup of diff S1 that was used in the localization, we had to pick an angular parameter theta on the circle. Then an element of diff S1 maps this to another parameter T, and H is the integral of the Schwarzian derivative of T with respect to theta. Now, so we got, anyway, I wrote, so that's where the constant pi squared in the numerator comes in. It comes by evaluating the Schwarzian derivative um, for the, at the fixed point. So having gotten this formula for Z, it's now convenient for reasons you'll see to take an inverse Laplace transform. And we can write Z of beta as the integral I've indicated over a parameter E that we eventually will interpret as energy and the function rho of e that comes in is another constant times the cinch of two pi root e. So we'll be discussing the physical interpretation of the formula in a bit. And I'm not writing it, but there's a similar formula for the case of diff S1 mod U1. So this is another good place to stop for questions since I'm going to uh, move on to another por portion of the talk in a moment. Uh, I think you can go on, we'll have questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. So now I'd like to explain why this formula was considered problematical and how Saad, Schenker and Sanford interpreted it. 
but that'll require explaining a little more physics. So general relativity is difficult to understand as a quantum theory, but in looking for understanding, physicists have looked for a simpler model in a lower dimension. One dimension is a little bit too low for Ramanian geometry as there's no curvature. Although actually there are interesting things to say even in one dimension, but for today, we're going to start in two dimensions. An obvious idea might be to start with the Einstein-Hilbert action in two dimensions, which is the integral of the Ricci scalar. But that doesn't work well because in two dimensions, this action is a topological invariant, according to the Gauss-Binet theorem. It turns out to be better to add a real, a scalar, real valued field phi. And then uh, what turns out to be for many purposes, a simple and illuminating model of two-dimensional gravity is Jakiv Teutelbaum gravity with the action I've written. So phi is a real valued field and R is the scalar curvature of a metric. And this is a very simple model of two-dimensional gravity because the action has been chosen so that a classical solution will have R plus two equals zero. In other words, a classical solution will be a hyperbolic Riemann surface. The Euler Lagrange equation for varying the action with respect to phi just tells us that R plus two will be zero. So the, as a result, the Feynman path integral for compact surfaces without boundary or with geodesic boundary of prescribed length is very simple. So the path integral, you're trying to integrate over metrics and over phi fields of the exponential of minus the action. And you also want to divide, well, you want to really integrate over pairs of the metric and phi field modulo diffeomorphisms. But I've schematically indicated by a factor of one over the volume. Volume is the volume of the diffeomorphism group. That's a way of reminding us that we want to divide by diffeomorphisms. So if we first integrate over phi, we get a delta function setting r plus two to be zero. And since the prefactor tells us we want to divide by the diffeomorphism group, it follows that the integral localizes on hyperbolic metrics mod diffeomorphism. In other words, on the moduli space of two manifolds with hyperbolic structure. So if sigma, the two manifold is orientable and of genus G, then the moduli space of two manifolds with hyperbolic structure is the usual moduli space Mg of Riemann surfaces of genus G. And we can show that the integral over the moduli space gives its usual volume. You show that by setting the path integral more carefully and you run into a ratio of determinants, which was understood by Ray and Singer and by Albert Schwartz. Well, to be the right of moisture torsion, but in this case, the right of moisture torsion reduces to the um, symplectic volume. So here in this formula, chi is the Euler characteristic and C is another non-universal constant that depends on the regularization. So it can be absorbed in the normalization of the Ve peterson form since the dimension of the moduli space is a fixed multiple of chi. But actually the way physicists would say it is that a change in C can be absorbed in shifting the coefficient of the Einstein-Hilbert term in the action, which we should also have included. Now, if sigma is unorientable, uh, everything I said is also true, except that the Reitermeister Reisinger torsion does not reduce to the symplectic volume, and therefore you get a more complicated story, which I won't really be able to describe today. Now, so far I've assumed that sigma is a compact surface without boundary or with the geodesic boundary of prescribed length. But what really led to progress in the last few years was applying JT gravity to, roughly speaking, the whole upper half plane H, the universal Teichmuller space. Except that it turned out that literally taking all of H is not the right thing to do. Not understanding that kind of was a roadblock in the field for a, a few years and got straightened out following Kateyev's work. 
trying to do Jakeev tidal bond gravity in all of H would lead us to the naive integral of the symplectic volume of that moduli space. And as, as I've told you, it's believed that there is not a reasonable definition of that symplectic volume. A better thing to do is to consider not all of H, but a very large region U. So on the left of this figure, I've very schematically sketched what I mean by, sketched a very large region, which has a wiggly boundary to show that it's generic, but large. So large really means large. So uh, since we said that the scalar curvature is minus two, that means there's a built-in length scale and therefore a built-in area scale. You might want to think of U as having an area like E to the 100, a really very large area. So U is a kind of an approximation to H, but it's an approximation. H has infinite area, U has finite area. So now we consider JT gravity on the region U that topologically is a disk. But we don't use the geodesic, the geodesic boundary conditions that I mentioned before. They'll make an appearance again later. But here, to do JT gravity on U, we instead specify the induced metric of the boundary that I'll call H, and also the boundary values of the real scalar field phi. And we specify them to be very large. So we specify H so that, um, well, okay. H is the induced metric on a one manifold, which is the boundary of U. So the only invariant is the perimeter. So we might specify H so that the perimeter is E to the 100. And we specify H to be equally large, sorry, phi to be equally large. So on a manifold with boundary, the Einstein-Hilbert action needs a boundary correction due to Gibbons, Hawking, and York. And that also appears here. It involves the extrinsic curvature K of the boundary and the induced metric H of the boundary. A classical solution of this action will still have R plus two equals zero because that's the Euler-Lagrange equation in the bulk. So as we take sigma to be a disk, it can be at least immersed in H, but with our condition on the boundary metric, it can actually be embedded in H. So as I said, the boundary condition is that the induced metric is specified and has extremely large circumference and phi on the boundary is also specified to be a very large constant. So we take a scaling limit as the length of the boundary goes to infinity, phi also becomes large and the ratio of the two is kept fixed. That ratio is what I'll call beta. And we drop a counter local term from the action. We find that the Feynman integral turns into our friend, the integral we discussed before, the integral of the exponential of the moment map over beta plus omega. It's by, by taking not all of uh, uh, H, not all of the upper half plane, but only a very, very large region in the upper half plane, we got this regularized version, which has H over beta plus omega. So uh, if we took beta to infinity, we'd get back the ill-defined version of the problem, the naive one, where we would just be trying to compute the volume of the this infinite dimensional homogeneous space. Now, how it is that um, our integral of JT gravity turns into this thing with the exponential of H over beta needs some explanation. So first of all, the reason that diff S1 mod PSL to R comes in is easy to explain. So the boundary of H well, it doesn't quite have a natural parameter, but it has a natural parameter up to the action of PSL2R. So um, it has a natural affine parameter up to the action of PSL2R or a natural <laughs> angular parameter, you could say. And the boundary of sigma, since it has a Riemannian metric, also has a natural parameter up to an additive constant. You could, that parameter is the arc length. You could divide it by a constant to make that itself an angle. So we have, two angular parameters where one is well-defined up to SL2R, the other well-defined up to an additive constant. Now, the key step that relates JT gravity to the integral with the moment map is that the integral of the, um, yeah, the integral of, it, sorry. Uh, okay, I should have had here K minus one rather than K. Instead of 
saying that we drop a diversion constant. What I really should have done over here, when I wrote the boundary term in the action, I should have simply said that the boundary term is k minus one rather than k. That still gives, with or without the minus one, it gives a well-defined variational problem and quantum path integral. But the limit we're interested in requires having uh, here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if I, I've tried to highlight that, but I'm not sure if you can see it. But it requires that that k should be k minus one. We can uh, see it. You can see it, okay. Um, in that case, I won't find another way to highlight it. So had I had a k minus one here then? We can see it, yes. You could see it, right. And then, uh, okay, having gotten that constant, we do not have to drop a divergent constant because we chose an action that made it work out automatically. This here k should be k minus one. And then, in this limit of a very large region u, the integral of k minus one turns out to be a multiple of the moment map h. So I remind you that the moment map was the um, Schwarzian derivative, integral of the Schwarzian derivative for comparing two parameters, where the parameters are the natural angular parameter on the, on the boundary of h and the arc length parameter of the boundary of u. Uh, this sigma should be u. Well, I, okay. Sigma equals u, what's not, since I've written sigma in a lot of places. So the action of JT gravity turns into this H over beta. And so the Feynman integral becomes the integral we discussed earlier, the integral over diff S1 mod PSL to R, not of the volume of universal Teichmuller space, but of the well, the exponential of the moment map over beta plus the symplectic form. And I've explained the steps by which we evaluate that formula to get an integral over E of this elementary function. Uh, so in this derivation, beta is the normalized length of the boundary. It's the actual length divided by phi. So you take the length of the boundary, so you take the limit in which the boundary of u becomes very long, phi goes to infinity. The ratio of the two is this parameter beta and the integral of JT gravity converges to this. Okay, now, uh, so we got an answer for the Feynman integral in the disk. And uh, the, the ver as I said, the first version of this answer was derived by Kateyev and then uh, it's been redone many times by other authors, but it's a problematic answer in terms of the physics involved. And I really wanted to try to explain that. To understand this, you should be familiar with holographic duality between gravity and the bulk of space-time and an ordinary quantum system on the boundary. So if the bulk were four-dimensional, the boundary would be three-dimensional and the ordinary quantum system on the boundary would be quantum field theory, perhaps not a familiar concept to everyone, although it would be the physicists and just certainly some of the mathematicians. But here the bulk, which is our Riemann surface that I called sigma or U is two-dimensional. So the boundary was just one-dimensional. It was that very long circle and an ordinary quantum system in one dimension is just described by giving a Hilbert space J and a Hamiltonian operator H on the Hilbert space. So in one dimension, there's no mystery mathematically about what's meant by quantum field theory. And the basic recipe of holographic duality predicts that the partition function of the bulk theory, which I called Z of beta, should be the trace in that Hilbert space of the exponential of minus beta times the Hamiltonian. So we computed Z of beta and holographic duality says it should be possible to interpret it in the form I've indicated. Now that prediction is false, but before checking that the prediction is false, 
I want to explain that this wasn't a complete surprise. Analogous calculations going back to the work of Hawking and collaborators in the 70s have always given the same problem. That problem is the essential mystery about quantum black holes. Now the calculations were always done in models like four dimensional general relativity that were too complicated for complete calculation. And there was always a possibility that the problem was an artifact of an incomplete calculation. But holographic duality and a variety of other developments that we're kind of skipping today made it possible to ask the question in a model that's so simple that we can do a complete calculation demonstrating the problem. So that's where we are. We, we'll, I'll explain in a second that the prediction was false and we'll interpret it as a very simple manifestation of a problem that's actually been with us for quite a while. To see that the prediction of the duality is false, if we do have a Hilbert space, H, and except I called it J, if we have a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian H acting on the Hilbert space, such that the operator each of the minus beta H has a trace, then H must have a discrete spectrum with eigenvalues E1, E2, and so on, which moreover must tend to infinity fast enough. And then the trace of each of the minus beta H is the sum of each of the minus beta times E sub I, where I is, E sub I is the ith energy level. And we could write that as an integral over energies of a sum of delta functions times each of the minus beta E. Instead, the integral we got for Z of beta, well, we wrote it as an integral over E of something with an E to the minus beta E, but the something was a smooth function rather than a sum of delta functions. So since the function we got is not a sum of delta functions, the prediction of the duality is false. However, the interpretation via JT gravity gives us a key insight that we did not necessarily have when we were just abstractly integrating over universal Tychomoy space. The constant C is exponentially large near the classical limit, which is kappa going to zero. We interpret this constant as the exponential of S where S is the classical black hole entropy, which is of order one over kappa or one over H bar and less large. A couple of these things are stated a little bit in a little more detail in the written version, which will be in the archive tomorrow. When C is exponentially large, the function C times sinh of two pi rho d, which we'll now write as e to the S times the sinh of two pi rho d, can be well approximated as a sum of delta functions. You'd have to look incredibly closely to see the difference between e to the 100 times sinh two pi rho d and a, sum, a very dense sum of delta functions. So the idea of Saad et al was to interpret e to the s times the sinh of two pi rho d, not as the density of states of a particular Hamiltonian, but as the average density of states of an ensemble of Hamiltonians, a random matrix. So in terms of the physics involved, this interpretation was kind of heretical and highly stimulating, but it's going to be hard to fully convey this. Now, what made them go in this direction? Well, one clue was given by the work of Kateyev, which had pointed in this direction. His work used a random ensemble, a more complicated one than the one used by Saad et al. Unfortunately, there isn't time today to explain Kateyev's ensemble and what he did with it. Another clue was the prior history of relations between two-dimensional gravity and random matrix theory. I mentioned that uh, such relations were developed 30 years ago, leading among other things to my conjecture about intersection theory and Konsevich's proof. Finally, there was a clue re related more directly to today's lecture that had to do with the volumes of moduli spaces. So as I said at the beginning, Mirzakhani found a new way to compute these volumes. Einard and Orenton had interpreted her work in terms of a random matrix ensemble. Well, in terms of what they call topological recursion. But topological recursion is very closely related to random matrix ensembles. And most important, the eigenvalue density of the einard orenton ensemble was precisely, well, after a change of variables, it was our function with a different interpretation of the constant S and a different normalization of the energy E.
So um, this led to the insight of Saad et al. that JT gravity can be reinterpreted as a random matrix ensemble with a particular spectral curve. So now I'm going to make a review of the, well, random matrices are a vast topic. I'm going to review uh, just a tiny part of it that, we're, that we need. So here M is going to be an N by N Hermitian matrix for some M. We're really interested in the limit that N becomes very large and goes to infinity. Then we pick some suitable function T of M and we consider the integral over matrices of the exponential of minus N times the trace of T of M. The reason to put a constant N in front of the uh, exponent is that that leads to a smooth, well, that leads to the kind of large N limit that I'll describe. So, uh, sorry, what I mean, so the space of matrices is a, a real vector space and DM is just the natural Riemannian measure on that real vector space. So if the function T is quadratic, this is a Gaussian matrix ensemble. So the original random matrices ensembles studied by uh, Wigner, Dyson, Meta, and others starting in the 50s and 60s involved the case that T was Gaussian. But for this problem, we're interested in the case that T is not quadratic. So we're discussing a non-Gaussian random matrix ensemble. So this integral or rather its logarithm has an asymptotic expansion for large N keeping T fixed. That's what we got by including uh, the fa a factor of n as a prefactor in the exponent. So the nature of the expansion is that log z is n squared times f0 plus something of order one, f1 plus one over f squared and n squared f2 and so on. And this expansion was originally described by Hooft in 1974. It's constructed by standard Feynman diagram methods, except that you find out that the Feynman diagrams are really what are sometimes called fat graphs. So, well, I didn't make a point of drawing fat graphs, but since uh, in that graph at the bottom of the slide, my lines do have some thickness. They weren't mathematical lines. You can think of them as being fat graphs. So a fat graph can be naturally drawn on a two manifold. And in this case, it's going to be a closed Riemann surface. So what Hoof showed is that if FG of T is the sum of connected Feynman diagrams of genus J, well, meaning, the sum of diagrams that can be drawn on the two manifold of genus J, then the F sub G's are the coefficients in the expansion of log Z in powers of N squared. So the expansion has the form I indicated in terms of Riemann surfaces of increasing genus. So in terms, of, if you want to know what physicists did with random matrices and gravity 30 years ago, the idea at that time was that we think of a we think of triangulating a Riemann surface with a vast number of simplices or triangles. So like I've drawn at the bottom, but uh, thinking of that as a tiny, tiny piece of a huge two manifold. And then an approximation to two dimensional gravity is to count the number of ways to triangulate a surface of given area. And uh, it often taught us that that could be expressed in terms of a matrix integral. And then studying the matrix integral in a different way led to progress with two-dimensional gravity and various other developments. But um, anyway, that was the story 30 years ago, but today we're doing something a little different. But one common ingredient is that instead of just making a Feynman diagram expansion, we want to evaluate the integral. So a direct way to evaluate the integral was introduced by Brezen, Parisi, Etzikson, and Zubair by now more than 40 years ago. So you diagonalize M, writing M as U lambda U inverse, where lambda is diagonal and U is unitary. And then the measure can be written explicitly in terms of these variables. DU is the Haar measure on the group UN and it, the integral over U cancels the factor of one over of the volume in the original integral. So we, we reduce to an integral over the eigenvalues. And this integral over the eigenvalues can be studied very nicely for large n because the integrand has a maximum as a function of the lambdas, which is a sharp maximum when n is large. 
Remember, there are many eigenvalues. If the density of lambdas is n times some function rho of lambda, constrained so that its integral is one, then the integrand can be written as the exponential of n squared times something. So the something has two terms. One comes from the original, what a physicist would call the classical action, n times t, that gives this term. The integral of rho of lambda, t of lambda, comes from the action. Then this other factor that comes from the measure, well, the measure turns into another term in the exponent. But importantly, both terms are of order n squared. So to determine the large n behavior, the two terms are equally important. You have, well, in the original approach, one solves an integral equation to find the maximum of that function as a function of rho under the constraint that its integral is one. So for a nice function t, the exponent has a unique maximum for some function rho of lambda, whose support is at an interval on the um, lambda axis. So I've plotted rho as a function of lambda. So rho has its support only in a certain interval on the lambda axis and it has a maximum. So the most famous case of this is the case that t is quadratic and then this curve here is a semicircle. For more, for more general t, you'll get some other curve, some other function, but still supported on an interval on the lambda axis. Now, if f0 of t is the value of the exponent at its maximum, then the leading approximation to the integral is just that, that z is the exponential of n squared times f0 of t. How can we compute the corrections to this leading behavior? Well, something very nice happens, but I won't really be able to explain it today. You should define a spectral curve in the y lambda plane. Y squared is minus rho squared of lambda. And it turns out that this curve is a double cover of the lambda plane branched only at the endpoints of the eigenvalue distribution. So it has two branch points at the endpoints of the support of the, well, as a real function, rho of lambda had, was supported on an interval and has square root singularities at the endpoints. So it can be continued to an analytic function of lambda or an algebraic function such that y squared equals minus rho squared of lambda um, is a hyperelliptic curve with two branch points. I should more accurately say it's normalization of such a curve. It has some additional singularities, but it's normalization is a hyperelliptic curve with two branch points. Once you know rho of lambda, you can forget about doing integrals and you can also forget the original function t. The whole expansion and anything else you might want to know can be worked out just using a knowledge of the spectral curve. A very useful version of this process is the topological recursion of Aynard and Orenton. I won't be able to explain that today. There's actually um, a short introduction to it in section four of my paper with Stanford. Now let's go back to the volumes of moduli spaces. So as I've explained, Saad et al. interpreted the function e to the s times sinh of two pi root e that comes from universal Tychmoy space as the density of eigenvalues for a random matrix from the type of ensemble that we've described. In principle, you're supposed to start with the function t and compute the corresponding density of energy levels n times rho sub t, where I make explicit the dependence on t. Then you take n to infinity while adjusting t so that n times rho sub t converges to the desired answer, which is e to the s times the cinch. That process is called double scaling. And in that process, the interval in which the eigenvalues are supported converges to the positive e axis, the branch points being at zero and infinity now. But we can skip all that work because everything we need to compute only depends on the spectral curve and we know that the spectral curve is going to be that y squared is minus the square of the eigenvalue density. So our spectral curve is the one I've indicated, which as I said, its normalization has, is a, just a double cover of the E plane branched at zero and infinity. Although it's got a lot of singularities at zeros of the function sinh two pi root E away from E equals zero. In short, all we have to do is start with the, this spectral curve and apply topological recursion to compute the expansion and various other quantities of interest. 
where after double scaling, we are expanding in powers of e to the minus s rather than one over n. Now we can compute the volumes. So to compute the volumes of moduli spaces, we're going to compute in this random matrix ensemble, not the integral, but the expectation value or the average of the trace of each of the minus beta h. Remember I told you that Saad et al interpreted the answer that came from universal Teichmuller space as the average value of trace e to the minus beta h in an ensemble rather than a particular trace e to the minus beta h. So that can be done explicitly applying topological recursion to the spectral curve. And the result is, is an expansion in powers of e to the minus 2s. And the result can be interpreted in terms of volumes. So to interpret the result in terms of volumes, well, first of all, we could do a Feynman diagram expansion. The expansion of trace e to the minus beta h involves Feynman diagrams drawn in an oriented two manifold with one boundary component, some of which are drawn. The way that happens is that when you make a Feynman diagram expansion, the trace turns into a boundary. That's a standard fact about Feynman diagrams. So if you just follow Udhav's recipe from 1974, the average value of trace e to the minus beta h will come from a sum of two manifolds whose boundary is a circle where the circle corresponds to the trace. So such a two manifold could be a disk u as shown on the left here, or it could be something more complicated like a genus two surface with one boundary as drawn on the right. And we're going to compare this Feynman diagram expansion to JT gravity on these manifolds. So um, I mean, the justification for making that comparison is that um, JT gravity gave a formula for the path integral on the disk, which we interpreted, which we've trying to interpret in terms of this, of the expansion of powers of e to the minus s of this random matrix ensemble. So the higher terms in JT gravity are the higher topologies. So we'll compare the higher topologies to the higher terms in the expansion of the trace. So the picture on the left is the leading term that we discussed at the beginning before I introduced JT gravity. And that was the integral over universal Teichmuller space and we've interpreted it as the integral of the density of eigenvalues times e to the minus beta h. So we're now interested in the higher topologies on the right. They contribute the higher order terms in the expansion in e to the minus two s, where the genus g term is a relative order e to the minus two g times s. So um, if I have got, well, a Riemann surface of higher genus, the boundary looks, is hugging close to the boundary of, anti, of hyperbolic two space. It's got a metric of constant negative curvature. There'll be a geodesic that's homo homologous to the boundary. A unique geodesic is homologous to the boundary. Here it's been drawn and I've said that it has length B. We're going to factorize the path integral in two pieces, one on the left, one on the right. So on the right is a Riemann, well, say, this picture on the right is a Riemann surface, sigma, which itself is made of two pieces, u prime and sigma prime. u prime, we're going to interpret, interpret as diff s1 mod u1. In other words, if I took u prime to go all the way out to the boundary, that would actually represent diff s1 mod u1. Instead, we think of this as a big piece in diff s1 mod u1 in the same sense that the picture on the left was a big piece in diff s1 mod sl2r. So the JT integral on this homogeneous space is similar to the one we discussed before, but it depends on a parameter b, which appears in the choice of a coadjoint orbit. So the symplectic structure of diff s1 mod u1 is not unique. It depends on a parameter b, which is the length of this geodesic. So what we do on the left is to do, imitate what I explained at the beginning of the lecture and integrate over the homogeneous space with the exponential of the moment map. So let me just write theta of b and beta for the JT integral on this orbit. There's an explicit function, for, explicit formula for it, which I'm not writing. I will in questions if you ask. The other half of sigma is this Riemann surface. 
sigma prime of genus bigger than one, or at least one, it has a geodesic boundary of length b. Let mgb be its moduli space and vg be the corresponding volume. Well, as I've explained, vgb is the JT path integral on this space, or on the space on sigma prime alone. To get the JT path integral on the total space, we have to take the integral on the left times the integral on the right and integrate over b. On the other hand, a particular term in the expansion of the matrix integral and powers of e to the minus s is supposed to equal JT gravity on the whole surface sigma, this whole right-hand picture. So we, we can do this in two ways. One is we take the matrix integral expanded in powers of e to the minus s. The other is we do this integral where theta is a certain elementary function that I haven't written down for you. And V is the unknown volume of moduli space. So after uh, working out the matrix integral and also working out theta and applying an inverse Laplace transform, you get an explicit formula for VG of B. So this procedure gives the right answer for the volumes because Einard and Orenton showed the topological recursion applied to the spectral curve we use here recovers a recursion relation that Maria Mirzakhani had used to compute the volumes. So matching with Mirzakhani was how Einard and Orenton determined which spectral curve to use. And having determined the spectral curve, their main insight was that Mirzakhani's recursion relation is equivalent to topological recursion for that spectral curve. The right spectral curve can also be found by relating volumes to intersection numbers. What Saad, Shanker, and Sanford did was to find the right spectral curve by trying to make sense out of the answer that you get from the integral over universal Teichmoy space. Now, the approach of Saad, Shanker, and Stanford is very interesting for physicists, but if you only care about volumes, you might not be sure why it's important. What does it really add to the results of Mirzakhani, for example? One answer is that possibly we've gained a better understanding of the relation between the infinite dimensional homogeneous space and the finite dimensional moduli spaces. Perhaps we now better understand the sense in which diff S1 mod SL2R should be thought of as a universal version of MGN. Also, we possibly now have a more direct understanding of the relation of intersection theory to random matrices, because in this approach, the meaning of the random matrix was clear. It's the Hamiltonian of the quantum mechanics. Yet another possible answer is given by my work with Stanford. We ran the whole story for super Riemann surfaces. And I can be much quicker in explaining it because at least at the level of detail that I will go into, every step has a precise analog in something I've told you in the ordinary case. First of all, what's a super Riemann surface? There are various approaches, but for today, we got a super Riemann surface by just replacing SL2R which is a group of linear transformations of R2 that preserve a symplectic form with OSP1 slash two, which is the corresponding supergroup of a symplectic supermanifold R2 slash one. So this is a Lie supergroup of dimension three slash two. Its Lie algebra contains a non-degenerate bilinear form that I denote as the trace. There's a super analog of the upper half plane H which is the homogeneous space OSP1 slash two divided by U1. It's a smooth supermanifold of real dimension two slash two. It carries a complex structure in which it has complex dimension one slash one. So I'm a little bit behind time. I had a slide where I wanted to explain how this is related to other definitions of super Riemann surfaces. So, well, it's explained very briefly here, but I don't want to go into much detail because partly because there isn't because I'm late and partly because there isn't time to explain it properly. But the super upper half plane itself is a super Riemann surface. That's this first bullet item here in which I explain why that's true. Now, if you're given a flat OSP1 connection on an ordinary two manifold sigma, that's, well, the, if you take the monodromy, you've got a discrete subgroup of OSP1 slash two and then if you take the quotient of the super upper half plane by the monitoring group, you get a super Riemann surface sigma hat. That is, you get a smooth super manifold that interpret, inherits a complex structure and super Riemann surface structure from H hat. 
So that's the relation of flat connections to super Riemann surfaces. But for today, we could just as well be studying the flat connections. So we don't really need any of this today. Now, with the definition I've given of moduli space in terms of flat connections, we can define the symplectic form and volume as in the Bosana case. The symplectic form is defined by the same formula and the volume is almost the same formula, except that instead of the Fafian, you have to use what's called the square root of the Berezinian. And then you can also define moduli spaces of super Riemann surfaces with the geodesic boundaries of specified lengths and their corresponding volumes that again are given by the same formulas. It's also possible to describe the super volumes in purely bosonic terms. The reduced moduli space of Mg is the moduli space M prime G that parametrizes an ordinary Riemann surface sigma with a spin structure which we can think of as, as a square root of its canonical bundle. The normal bundle to, so the reduced space can be thought of as a submanifold of MG and its normal bundle in MG is the vector bundle U whose fiber is H1 with values in K to the minus one half. And then we can view this bundle as a real vector bundle and let chi of U be its Euler class and by general arguments about symplectic supermanifolds. Well, first of all, the symplectic form of MG restricts on its reduced space to the ordinary symplectic form of M prime G, which is simply the vile Peterson form pulled back to M prime G from MG. And then general arguments about symplectic manifolds show that the volume of the supermoduli space can be interpreted in terms of conventional bosonic geometry by the formula I've written there. So what I'll say about supervolumes is a purely classical statement about the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with spin structure. The super analog of JT gravity is JT supergravity, which computes the volumes of the supermoduli spaces in general with geodesic boundaries of prescribed lengths. As before, it's important to consider the special case of a Riemann surface, which is the super upper half plane or more precisely a very large piece of it as in the left-hand side of the picture I keep drawing. So the boundary of the large piece is what we might call S1 slash one, the super analog of a circle. And the super JT path integral on the big piece is again, the integral over the infinite dimensional homogeneous space of the exponential of the moment map over beta plus um, the symplectic form where beta is a constant that determines how quickly we approach the limit of a large piece. That's the closest universal super Teichmuller analog of the super moduli space volume. So in our first paper, Stanford and I computed this integral again using localization, and this was the answer. So H is again the moment map for a U1 subgroup, just as in the bosonic case. So again, this isn't the trace of e to the minus beta h for a Hamiltonian acting on a Hilbert space, but now we know what to do. We have to consider an ensemble of random Hamiltonians. So we can rerun the story with a few changes. First of all, the formula for z of beta tells us the spectral curve. I've written what the spectral curve is going to be. But the matrix ensemble will not be the same type as before. One way to see it must be different is that now y squared is one over e near the endpoint of the spectrum rather than e. In other words, instead of a square root branch point, you have a sort of inverse square root branch point where y goes as one over the square root of e. So for the type of ensemble we considered before, for the type of ensemble we considered before, we had a one over square root of e singularity Whereas now we, sorry, before we had a square root of E singularity, but now it's one over square root of E. So that means that you have to do a different kind of matrix ensemble. But you can guess what kind of matrix ensemble it should be on the following grounds. Because we're now doing JT supergravity, the dual quantum mechanical system is supposed to be supersymmetric. So we have to do random supersymmetric quantum mechanics, not just random quantum mechanics. Supersymmetric quantum mechanics 
means that the Hilbert space is Z2 graded by an operator that I call minus one to the F. So the, it's a Z2 grading, the square is one. I've blocked, I agonize it with eigenvalues one and minus one. The Hamiltonian commutes with the grading, but it's supposed to be the square of an operator that's odd. So an odd operator is an operator that anti-commutes with minus one to the F. So Q is a self-adjoint operator that anti-commutes with minus one to the F. I've written a generic, on the left here, I've written a generic self-adjoint operator that commutes with minus one to the F. There's a slight flaw in the system. Uh, for the next colloquium, I recommend trying to find a way to avoid extraneous bundles during the lecture. But um, anyway, um, okay, so where was I? So um, we have a Z2 grading and the Hamiltonian is supposed to be the square of an odd self adjoint operator Q. So I've written for Q a generic odd self adjoint operator and then H is Q squared. So um, a random ensemble for Q is defined by the measure exponential of minus N times the trace of a function of Q squared. So this is one of the standard random matrix ensembles constructed by, well, there's, I should have perhaps said Weir, Wishart as well, but by people like Vera Bouchard, Altlan, Zirenbauer, and in an earlier version by Wishart. If T is linear, the, okay, the classic case is the T is linear and this is a Gaussian ensemble. Again, we're interested in the nonlinear case. Now I want to explain why this kind of ensemble works for giving us the behavior we want of the spectral curve near its endpoints. That's very easy to see. Let mu be an eigenvalue of Q and let F of mu D mu be the density of eigenvalues. Because the measure is even in Q since Q was odd under the grading, F of mu equals minus F, F of mu equals plus F of minus mu, not minus F of minus mu. Uh, so it's generic to have f of zero not equal zero. So you could also find a generic class where f of zero is zero, but in an open set in the space of all t's, f of zero is non-zero. And that's all we need because since h is q squared an eigenvalue of h is mu squared, e is mu squared. And then since f of mu d mu, is f of e to the one half times d e over the square root of e, you see that the density of eigenvalues behaves as e to the minus a half near e equals zero. So this kind of ensemble is a good candidate for the present problem because it's supersymmetric and has the right behavior near the origin. So with this particular matrix ensemble, there's again a version of topological recursion and applying it in the double scaling limit with the spectral curve that we have, we get an expansion of the average of trace e to the minus beta h and powers of e to the minus 2s. And by the same logic as before, the terms in this expansion have an interpretation in terms of volumes of supermoduli spaces. So in this way, Stanford and I determined a recursion relation that determines the volumes of the supermoduli spaces. But I should say, by the way, the same spectral curve was studied by uh, Norbury with a different motivation. And he obtained result, similar results from the topological recursion for the spectral curve. The approach of Stanford and I added the interpretation in terms of supermoduli spaces. By imitating, so we were then able to prove our formula by repeating what Mirzikhani did for ordinary Riemann surfaces. So, First of all, by imitating her derivation, we obtained a Mirtikani style and recursion relation for the volumes of the supermoduli spaces. And by imitating Einard and Orenton, we showed that the recursion relation that comes from the matrix ensemble agrees with the Mirtikani style and recursion relation. But unfortunately, to explain all this would call for another occasion. I'll just very briefly mention that the problem has a few interesting refinements. One is that the operator P can have a non-zero index which is the difference in dimension between the odd and even subspaces 
of the Hilbert space. To compute the volumes of supermoduli space, you take the index to be zero. The same type of matrix ensemble, but with P assumed to have a non-zero index, appears to compute the volumes of spaces of super Riemann surfaces with what are called Ramon punctures, though we don't have a general proof of this. So that's one generalization. Another is that the spin structure of a Riemann surface or a super Riemann surface can be even or odd. To compute volume separately for each of the two cases, you also have to consider a somewhat different matrix ensemble in which H is still Q squared and the spectral curve is the same, but the Hilbert space is not assumed to be Z2 graded. So I guess that's what I have for today. Thank you. I wish I could clap. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Edward. Uh, thank you. So um, we are going to take questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand through Zoom and we will try to get to you. I am not seeing any questions. There, there, there are hands uh, raised. Uh, there's. Uh, Greg Moore has a question. I think. Can you can you uh, call on him? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, actually, I had two questions. Um, one is if you replaced uh, JT gravity on ADS two by let's say a full the effective theory of a full string theory compactification to ADS two. Mm -hmm. Would we still be averaging over Hamiltonians or would there be a particular Hamiltonian? Okay, Greg's, well, even without going all the way to ADS2, your, your broader question could be, uh, okay, if, if we, okay, uh, I'll interpret the question as follows. So in the case of JT gravity, it was defined by a classical field theory. We didn't go in knowing what the bulk boundary was, dual was supposed to be or whether there was one really. And it turned out that the boundary dual isn't a particular quantum mechanical system, but an average of an ensemble. However, there are cases, in fact, particularly interesting cases, where we do know what the boundary dual is supposed to be. And I'm sufficiently old fashioned that I still believe that when there is a well-defined boundary dual, it's dual to a specific quantum theory in the bulk, which in some sense is probably a better theory than the ones that don't have boundary duals. But uh, I think it's all up in the air. I, okay. I, think, I think it's a great question. I don't, I don't claim to have to be able to say much more than I just said. Thank you. I, and then my other question was, I was intrigued when you said when, that by the fact that you've explained that um, you get you get a better understanding of the relationship between random matrix theory and intersection theory on moduli space of curves. But does this shed any light on where the Konsevich matrix model is coming from? Because that's another matrix model that gives intersection theory? Uh, not yet, anyway. So um, the work I know that came closest to maybe explaining for physicists where the Kuntzevich matrix model came was by Rustelli and Gaiotto. I don't know it that well. So I'm reluctant to try to explain it, but it involved consider considering particular D brains uh, in these C less than one systems. Um, possibly the okay. Anyway, I have nothing new to add about that. I think it's a great question. I don't have any insight about it, unfortunately. Thanks. Sure. Ezra? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, you had a boundary term for the uh, gravity action, yes. uh, the Gibbons Hawk, uh, the Gibbons Hawking York term. Uh, if one goes to a first order formalism, uh, one could um, drop the boundary term in the action. I wonder if there is a possibility of a, a, a first order action for the JT uh, well, model. There is. In fact, it's better, to uh, it's better to study it in the first order version. I was just trying to cut corners and save a little bit of time. So, <laughs> See, the, the nicest, oh gosh. It's a little hard to write on this thing. <laughs> so.
there it is in terms of gravity. But the most elegant version of the, see, gravity is related to um, gauge theory. In this case, well, gravity not in general, but in this two dimensional case, it's related to gauge theory, where the gauge group is SL2R. So what are the, what, sorry. So in the SL2R description, there's a gauge field A, but there's supposed to be a field equation that FA is zero. So what kind of field theory could we write that would tell us that F sub A is zero? Well, the obvious way to do it is what is often called BF theory. So the action is the integral of the trace of B times F sub A, where B is an adjoint valued scalar field. So first of all, this is a first order formalism because it's literally it's first order in derivatives. But secondly, you'll find out that um, um, starting with this first order formalism, giving appropriate definitions of the fields in the gravitational version as certain components of B and F and integrating out some terms uh, from this gauge theory version, you can get to the gravitational version. That's awesome. Uh, is there a supersymmetric version of that then? Yes, there is because you just replaced SL2R by OSP1 slash two and literally, literally write the same action. So okay. not only you can do that, but for a lot of purposes, it's much better to do that. Let me, let me give an example. So Stanford and I also studied the case of un unorientable two manifolds. So it's not, first of all, the moduli space of hyperbolic structures still exists, but it's not symplectic anymore. And it's a Riemannian manifold, so it has a Riemannian measure, but that one is actually the wrong measure. The right measure comes from the torsion. And the best way, it's much easier to understand why the torsion comes in if you start with the BF version of the theory rather than the gravitational version of the theory. So that's an example. If I organize my thoughts, I think I'd find other examples. But for many purposes, the BF version of the theory is easier to study than the gravitational version. I just was cutting corners in the lecture to, to, not, to try to not explain everything all at once. Thank you. Sure. Richard Nally. Um, thank you. Is, is there an analog of this random matrix story for Riemann surfaces that can teach us something about Calabi-Yau moduli spaces? Well, it's certainly not known how to do that. But I don't want to say a hasty no either. Um, when you have a Calabi L manifold, there are topological strings. Topological strings can be written in terms of matrix models sometimes, more often than you'd think. I, I can't answer yes to that question, but I'm also a little bit nervous about answering no. So <laughs> let's just say not, it's not yet known. OK, thank you. Um, the best answer that is known, though, is that topological strings on Cobbiels can sometimes be expressed in terms of matrix models. So that's something which is known that points in the direction of your question anyway. Okay, thank you. And maybe last question from Sasha Voronov. Uh, hello, <coughs> Edward, as far as I understood from your very last slides uh, about when you mentioned uh, the uh, Ramon punctures, uh, the modular space, the super modular space FGB uh, was analogous to the modular space with neither Schwartz punctures. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was wondering uh, what would be the boundary analog of Ramon punctures and would it be interesting to, sh interesting to show, to study the analog of those constructions for the Ramon punctures? Mm -hmm. So you can consider two things. Oh, sorry, a little hard to draw. Okay, there's that's meant to be a boundary, and this is meant to be a puncture. Now, and the boundary has got a length, let's say B. So uh, we actually considered both both types of puncture and both types of boundary in the in the paper. Mm -hmm. So if you have a boundary of Ramon type, the volumes are zero. If one or more volume boundaries has Ramon types, uh, not so for a puncture of Ramon type. There's a fundamental difference between Ramon and Nevers Schwartz. Okay, let's first discuss bosonic Riemann surfaces. Let me draw a puncture more like it is in hyperbolic, in the hyperbolic world. In the hyperbolic world, a puncture is really a cusp. Mm -hmm. Now, in, the hyper, in ordinary Riemann surfaces, 
the small b limit of a geodesic boundary is a puncture, a cusp. And that's also true for super Riemann surfaces in the Nevers Schwartz case. So a Nevers Schwartz puncture is just the small b limit of a Nevers Schwartz right. boundary. Yeah. And therefore adds nothing new. But a Riemann puncture is not the small b limit of a Riemann boundary. So the Riemann punctures are fundamentally new. And although we didn't have a general proof, we found in low examples that we could get the volumes of moduli spaces with Riemann punctures by taking the index in the uh, random matrix ensemble to be non-zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Riemann boundaries, the volumes are all zero. I see. Yeah, it would be really interesting to find out what uh, Ramon, the analogs of Ramon boundaries would be then. You can define them, but the you can define yeah. Ramon boundaries and define uh, them, but the volumes are zero. But in, in such a way, I meant uh, so that the volumes are not zero, possibly. That they correspond to the to to the to this computation that you made or that you thought would correspond to Ramon punctures. Well, right. Okay, I can't rule out that there's something else you can do, but mm -hmm. if you literally pose the problem of volumes, see, the volumes you get a symplectic manifold with Ramon boundaries, but its volume is zero. Yeah. Oh, something that makes that obvious. Oh, sorry, I better not make any claims about what makes it obvious. You can find it discussed in the paper. Sure, thank you. Thank sure. you so much. Sure. And thank you very much, Edward. Uh, for the uh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation again. And I hope everybody keeps safe during the coronavirus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing the next talk by Costello in two weeks from now. Bye-bye.